Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 23rd of February 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance and the Liz is here. Great to have you on board. And uh, we're going to have an interesting chat tonight. There's a lot to talk about in the world of crypto, digital and uh, finance more generally. Lots of big questions, lots of uh, interesting discussion points and maybe some answers too. Who knows? Um, I will just start by saying what I always say, just to be clear, that this is uh, not financial advice uh, in any way whatsoever. Don't know your individual circumstances. It's a general conversation just about uh, things that uh, we're interested in. Uh, do please play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. The stream is actively moderated and uh, we will lock people out if uh, they get uh, uh, creating a few bits of mayhem. 23rd of February 2021. If you're watching this replay, you'll know whether we're right, whether we're wrong. Uh, if you want to get my attention, do use that Walk the World. There's always plenty going on in the chat and very often I miss it unless it's actually got out Walk the World. So that's the best thing to do. Or if you want to make quite sure that your question gets noticed, you can use the Suda chat. Suda Super Chap, of course, uh, also is a way of making a contribution to help the channel. So that is, I guess, our normal conversation. And without further ado, let me bring Adam Stokes in. Adam, are you there? G'day, Martin. Great to see you. Hey, how are you doing? Fantastic. A bit cold in Canberra tonight, but it's after a bit of a heat wave as the markets are cooling down a little bit as well. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, great to have you on. And um, I had a quick look uh, earlier on today at uh, your website. You know, there's quite a lot of good stuff going on there and a uh, few interesting new guests and what have you as well. So that's uh, pretty cool. So, folks, if you want to know more about Adam, go to his website. We'll put his uh, link up shortly. But I guess a good place to start, Adam, would be to ask you the really fundamental question. What got you interested in this whole crypto thing and when? Great question. And everyone can probably remember how they got into the crypto journey. So by way of background, uh, I've always been an investor. I've invested in property, shares since about 18, coins, stamps, foreign currencies, uh, anything that I thought would go up in value in a way to build wealth. But essentially the journey started when I went to a friend's house and they said, hey, you have to watch this documentary. They were halfway through it and I said, no, just keep watching. And they said, no, we're going to start from the beginning. And I watched this documentary from the beginning and it changed my life forever. Uh, it, it really taught me, one of my degrees is economics and I was actually quite embarrassed to realize how little I knew about money after watching this documentary on crypto. And my first introduction to actually owning crypto was mining crypto. So, of course, there's a few ways to buy crypto uh, and get, obtain crypto, but mining was really where my journey first began. So I made a considerable investment in mining equipment in 2016 and have been, if you will, if the term is stacking sats and building up my crypto bags ever since then. <laughs> and just for those people who have no idea what you're talking about, when you say mining crypto, I mean, this is this is high tech computer gear running lots of complex calculations to try and uncover the secret codes of particular bitcoins, correct? Yeah. So I guess the easiest way to explain it is if, if you imagine if I was going to send you money from me to you, I would nearly I would really need a bank to do that. Uh, that's how it was done for many years. Now we have a decentralized model where I don't need a bank. I can send it, if you will, text it directly to you without some third party intermediary service. But I need someone to verify that transaction. And that transaction is done on an open source ledger. And that ledger is run by miners. Now miners has two meanings. Miners is a person and a machine. So I am a miner in the sense that that's what I do in the background. Uh, not so much now, I'm more into the trading, but I still mine in the background. And if you actually go to my site, my other site, uh, the crypto.land, you too can mine with a little bit of your computer power in the background. But to answer your question, miners, the machines, verify the transaction between you and I. The fundamental breakthrough of crypto, uh, we'll go with Bitcoin. And when I speak about Bitcoin, I'm, I'm speaking broadly. Sure, that was arguably the first. But the fundamental breakthrough with Bitcoin was the ability to avoid the double spend. So if you think of digital images, I can copy and paste a uh, digital image infinitely. I can do that with videos. I can do it with any file. So why can we not do it with Bitcoin? Why is it that I can't send you a Bitcoin and then send the same Bitcoin to all of your viewers uh, as you can with any other digital 
item or file. Well, the double spend rule was um, achieved or the, the phenomenon of being able to break this problem down and ensure that Bitcoins weren't sent twice to different people. And really, when you're actually sending, not to go too much on a tangent, but it's important that you know that when you're actually sending Bitcoins to someone, you're not actually sending a file to them per se. There is a ledger, an open source ledger that says, right now, Adam holds this Bitcoin. And if I send it to Martin, everyone agrees that on this open source ledger that I have now released this Bitcoin from me to Martin and I can't release that Bitcoin again. So the double spend rule was really overcome, not so much by ensuring that something couldn't be copied and pasted, but rather looking at the problem in a different way and decentralizing a ledger. Just as a bank holds a ledger, crypto holds ledgers too. Mm. And, and, you know, we often hear about um, the blockchain and the fundamental technology that underpins essentially the way that, um, you know, this works. Um, but just in terms of context, you know, there are more than 4,000 coins out there. Bitcoin obviously is the big mum of them all, um, worth probably a trillion US in its own right now, um, but more than 4,000 coins. Um, and the point I suppose to make is that they're not all the same, right? There's a massive, massive morass of different types of coins for different purposes, for different things. And um, as soon as you start unpeeling the onion, as it were, it gets quite complicated quite quick. So it's quite good just to underscore those those fundamental points, right? It's about trust, it's about decentralized, and it's about making sure that um, you know the sum of the parts can't equal more than the sum of the parts. That's right. And it's, it's also immutable and open sourced. But uh, you're right, there are, there are thousands of cryptocurrencies. But if you're new to crypto, if you're watching and you're new to crypto, I want you to think of crypto in, in two main categories. First of all, you have a simple store of value coin and that coin is as an example bitcoin all it does in the simplest terms is holds value and transfers that value from me to you or just holding it in myself the next generation of cryptocurrencies was smart coins coins that can actually actually do something that might be something like ethereum or cardano where you can execute a smart contract without a centralized third body so this is where we'll probably touch on this a bit later but this is where you can do decentralized finance insurances other contracts that can be executed without a third party as in a, a bank or an insurance company or some type of intermediary something where we can program a coin to say right now when this parameter happens uh, we'll go with a simple example let's say i insure a train ticket so i this is now we're going into smart coins I buy a train ticket and I opt for insurance on that train ticket through a smart contract coin. That smart contract coin will look at everything that's happening around it. And if that train leaves on time, I don't get my insurance payout because everything's happened as it was supposed to. But if the train for whatever reason doesn't leave on time or I miss the train and I've opted for insurance, the smart coin can execute that payment to me automatically as opposed to the olden day model that we do at the moment where we'd fill out a form, submit an insurance claim and ask for someone to pay for our insurance. So that's one of countless examples of how smart contract coins are going to change the way that we do everything in the world. Bitcoin is merely one application on the blockchain. If you look at email as is to the internet, Bitcoin is as to the blockchain. So the, if you're new to crypto, I think that the most important thing to realize is that just as the evolution of internet was not email, email was simply an application on the internet, Bitcoin is not the true evolution of everything that's going to happen in the smart contract and blockchain space. Certainly, it is probably one of the most important and the most fundamental, but it is not everything. Mm, I think that's really important to understand. In fact, I made a show yesterday ahead of this show covering uh, distributed finance, right? And I went through some of the applications that you can apply this same distributed thinking to, be it lending, be it insurance, being, as you say, you know, insuring around events and all the, uh, those things. And that's really the point that Bitcoin and payments is just one instance of something which is much broader and fundamentally much more fundamental in terms of the way that things could work. And, and, you know, there are people who would argue that, well, if you watched how distributed financing is 
beginning to emerge, you could see a future where banks aren't required anymore because they are intermediaries. What do they do? They basically sit between the borrower and the depositor, you know. But why would you need to do that if you can have an immutable ledger that does all of that and um, you know does it quicker and more effectively? And those are some of the things that I think are really quite intriguing in terms of where this could actually be heading. Now it's early days, and I especially as you could argue that um, you know Bitcoin with its lion's share and with the um, stuff that's going on is 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 in a way leading the way. But don't confuse crypto and Bitcoin. The universes are not equal. Martin, if I may say, I'm very proud of you because uh, to my viewers, uh, to all the viewers who haven't been on our journey together, Martin and I are not new to interviewing one another. Normally I'm interviewing Martin. And if I may, when we first met, I, I don't think you fully grasped that, but now I can see just with what you said, <laughs> you, you do. And I'm, as I said, I'm very proud of you because <laughs> you're absolutely right. You're completely right. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually decentralized finance, so DeFi. And the reason why banks and arguably governments are so petrified of Bitcoin and the power that comes with cryptocurrencies is because you're right, Martin. We really no longer need banks. We no longer need banks because I am a bank. So if I want to get a loan now, I don't have to go to a bank. And, and this isn't a concept. This is something I can do right now and have done right now, uh, as in, in my crypto journey. I can go to the free market and say, hey, I want to borrow $1,000. So instead of going to a one of the big four, as an example, and filling out a loan application, I can go out to the entire world and say, who wants to lend me $1,000? Now, at first, one person may not want to lend me $1,000, but maybe 1,000 people want to lend me $1, or 10,000 people want to lend me 10 cents, or 100,000 people want to lend me 1 cent. So at their end, their risk is reduced. At my end, I get a lower interest rate. What happens is we now have these new markets where the lender does so at a lower risk. They're not lending me an entire thousand dollars. They could be lending me one cent, one dollar, a tenth of a cent, a thousandth of a thousandth of a cent, which is a fun word to say. At my end, I can get it faster and I can also get it at a lower interest rate. Now, a reasonable question that raises from this is like, how do we know that people are going to pay and how do we know that this is going to work well the, the uh, analogy i give is airbnb or uber how do we know that when we rent out our house in on airbnb that they're not going to burn down the house and steal everything within it well there is a certain element of risk but we build up trust and profile so initially i may be only able to borrow ten dollars or a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars but as i build up my credit history just as i do with a bank just as i do with uh, open source platforms such as Airbnb, I gain more stars or more trust and more people are willing to take more risk in me. Uh, concurrently, governments are worried about crypto in the sense that we no longer need to use this imaginary money called fiat. And of course, fiat, its actual meaning is by decree. I, I say it has value because it has value. But I, I think that this is only the, the tip of where we're going with all the possibilities we have with crypto yeah and uh, you know early days and I often say to people that um, you know don't think of this as a fully matured thing yet right this is very early but if you look back over even the last you know three to five years the journey has been quite remarkable and uh, you know it's gone all sorts of different ways I mean I can remember the days when Bitcoin was very much just spoken about as an alternative payment platform right and then it moved into something different and then it moved into a currency and then it moved into a, you know, it, it, it's, it's all evolved. And I think that's the point. The rate of evo evolution is actually pretty amazing, right? And of course, that's partly because it's digital and partly because the rate of uh, progress is, is, is moving. But what I think people need to understand is this, this is not an end game yet. It's not even the big end of the beginning, right? We're right at the very early stages of something which could fundamentally redefine finance and money and payment systems but actually more than that it comes to questions of authority right what gives fiat money its value right so i've got a five dollar note but the five dollar note is worthless unless the government stands behind it right so for fiat to work you need a government to stand behind it what about though crypto you know you don't have that same 
intermediary, you have a system which effectively is ledger driven and distributed and all of those things. So you don't have that same blockage in the middle, right? Um, but of course, that in turn creates a huge challenge for regulators and for central banks who worry about whether in fact the uh, system is going to be, you know, the banking system can be controlled or whether it will uh, just uh, run out of um, um, you know, control. In fact, Cookie Boy asked the question, which I'll throw at you, Adam, which is, uh, are you worried about governments in the future banning cryptos and starting their own digital currency? I think that's a really important question to, to explore. Um, so, so Cookie Boy, that's a great question. But Martin, I'm just going to go back a little step because you, mm. you raise a really good point. So you say yeah. governments create a value for fiat because they say it has. Well, Fiat has never ever worked. We we can see that the <laughs> lifespan of fiat is around fifty years, and we we really had this fiat since nineteen seventy one, and we can see it's constantly going down. And over the last hundred years, we've fiat's lost ninety eight percent of its value. So, the belief that a government can control the value of dollars or cents or rupees or euros or anything, it is really not a real belief. As in, you may believe it, but it's not a reality. And the reality is, inflation can completely or continually erodes our money. So I think in an interview that we did a, a, about a year ago, we spoke about the value of a loaf of bread. So a loaf of <laughs> bread uh, for my great grandfather was probably, you know, a threepence or whatever, a few cents. Now that same loaf of bread is $5. And it's not because the loaf of bread costs uh, 50 times or 100 times more to make. It's because the money that we're buying it with is worth less. And no matter how much governments try to control money, Money was never meant to be a function of the government. Money is a language by the people and for the people. It's determined by the free market. Now, over history, it might have been shells, beads, glass, skins, leathers, um, engravings on rocks. Money Salt. is what, yep, whatever the money, Pokemon cards, whatever the people uh, value as money is money. It could be also a bus ticket, frequent flyer points, anything that people hold as value, that that becomes money. And when we try to artificially control money, we have a thing called inflation. And we then we have, when we try to control it more, we have runaway or hyperinflation. Greece, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Cyprus, Argentina, take your pick, we are next. And we can see that the US dollar is continuing, continually being pumped and falling in value. So to ask a question, to answer your question, uh, the viewer about Am I worried about governments controlling it? So I recently made a mini documentary about the four greatest threats to Bitcoin. And one of those threats was, in fact, the government trying to come in and control it. So governments can't control crypto any, um, just as they can't really control the Internet. They can try and put firewalls up. But an example I give is when I was in China a few years ago, uh, Facebook is banned as an example. So the government came in, communist government, and said, we're banning Facebook. Well, what do the people do? Of course, they just put on a VPN and bypass whatever the government's doing. So because this is the internet of the money, because it is a form of free speech, a form of freedom and democracy, it's very difficult, almost impossible to stop it. But then it goes to the next level. Governments who are choosing to try and ban crypto are putting themselves in a very, very difficult situation. They're in fact robbing their own economies of future wealth. So there are countries that have attempted to ban crypto and Bitcoin. I, I believe it was Zimbabwe just recently who said, if we don't ban this, we're gonna have no way of controlling this money that we've got, which is now pretty much worth nothing anyway. So they kind of admitted, I believe it was Zimbabwe, that they admitted that their money was worth nothing and they couldn't allow another money to come in. Well, by taking that step, what they've done is they've denied their people, their economy, their country of unforeseen wealth opportunities where people could get into this crypto, this technology, this money, this language while it's young and while people can afford it. Actually, you, you can always afford it because it's divisible by 100 million parts, so you can break it down into smaller parts. But by doing that, they're actually putting themselves behind the progression of the world. It would be the same, I, I give this analogy, imagine a country coming in saying, we're going to ban all internet. We're gonna ban all internet because we don't want people having freedom of information and the passage of commerce around the world. Well, 
that might be good in the short term, but as the world progresses and they've cut their people off from the internet or the internet of knowledge or the internet of money, it is going to hurt themselves. The other thing I'd say on this is that governments, uh, the Australian government as an example, realise very quickly, hey, if we embrace this, this is in fact a way that we can generate tax revenue. Now, whether this is a good or a bad thing, that's irrelevant. <laughs> the reality is, is that, Martin, I pay the good Australian people a lot of a lot of money in tax revenue, revenue that I'm generating from being involved in crypto. I declare everything, I do everything above board, it's very traceable, it's not this cash economy um, that can be done under the table. And as a result, my government, my people, my society is getting a lot of revenue from money generated from around the world. So that's probably a long winded way of saying, no, it's not possible. And even if it were, they would really be disadvantaging themselves. <laughs> now, you see, there's a couple of interesting observations I'd have there. First is if you listen to Janet Yellen's recent comments, so she's now, you know, ex Fed now in the Treasury in the US, or if you listen to Lagarde, who was at, uh, um, I would say the World Bank, but the other the other mob, um, uh, and then uh, is now in the Euro um, Bank, you know, the uh, in the Eurozone, and is the head of the Euro Eurozone. They're, they're both being very, very nasty when it comes to crypto, right? And basically saying, well, you know, it's really, it's all about... Um, fraudulent transactions and money laundering etc despite the fact that all of the data that i've seen suggests that the proportion of transactions that are actually crypto related f going into those nefarious ends are probably lower than in the main banking system right think of westpac and uh, money laundering there um so there Absolutely. does seem to be a little bit of a sort of a, a spin story being created by central bankers to try and if you like scare people into saying no, 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 no. We need to have you know a central bank digital currency which is controlled, etc. In other words, what they're doing is replicating the physical currency digitally, but putting the same controls around it and trying to manage it in the same way. That seems to me the the deficiency in the way they're thinking about it, rather than understanding the advantage of breaking some of those bounds and effectively stepping beyond it. And I come. Oh. Of course, sorry to mm. interrupt, but it, mm. it absolutely. So uh, imagine you had for over a century the ability, we'll, we'll be fair, we'll say since 1971, since uh, Nixon delinked the gold standard from the US dollar. Imagine for 50 years, half a century, having the ability to simply press print, and this is no exaggeration, and print as much money as you wanted for as long as you wanted diluting everyone else's money and making them weaker and poorer and more vulnerable. But the weaker and more vulnerable they come, you can simply print more and more and more. Imagine having the power of fractional reserve lending and imagine every technology around you progressing, everything advancing, whether it be from transport to communication to knowledge sharing to medicine, everything advancing except for one area of technology and that area is money. So the greatest disruption to these two centralized bodies, governments and federal reserves or banks, this ability for them to print money out of thin air, as they have done indefinitely for the better part of a half a century, is now being stripped of them and that they are rightfully absolutely terrified of what's about to happen. In fact, it's already happened. And they are clutching at anything they can to hold on to this money, this corrupt money that they've been printing, this imaginary word, this money called fiat, which is not real and has no value. And the only value that money really has, as in fiat, is that uh, I guess if I had a pile of US dollars and I was really cold, I could put it on a fire and burn it and create some heat and that would give me some intrinsic value, if you will. But other than that, this fiat has no money, uh, no value, whereas crypto has it has value in two forms. So first of all, it has value because the market says it has value. It has value because there is a finite supply and an increasing demand. But beyond that, it, I, I like Andreas Antonopoulos' uh, analogy of looking at the pyramids. If we go to Egypt and we look at a pyramid as an example, these massive periods, pyramids, you don't actually have to be an expert to look at this pyramid and say, I can see that thing has value. I can see that a lot of energy has gone into that. So I, I'm guessing there's going to be a question about the energy that's put into Bitcoin. But 
that becomes forms part of why Bitcoin has value. It's finite. There is a demand for it, and it does create a relative amount of energy to give it value in itself. Hmm. Very interesting. And uh, I've been watching some of the, uh, the the chat conversations. People are getting quite animated. You know, on both sides of the argument is. Yeah, is it fool's? You know, this one here is uh, <laughs> digital currency is fool's gold on one side, and the the other is uh, much more you know on the other side of the story. But look, I want to ask you this question, Adam. Here is the chart of Bitcoin at the moment, right? And you can see there that it continues to drop from its recent highs, right? Mm -hmm. Now it'll probably bounce up again. Who knows? I have no idea. My, my question to you is, what's driving? the value of Bitcoin. Clearly, it's a market without any underlying fundamental value. So it is fundamentally about the um, numbers of people wanting to buy versus to sell, right? It's a really efficient process, I guess. So why is the price where it is? And why isn't it double where it is or half where it is? Okay, so two parts, it does have value. It it is a way, it is basically a digital gold, and it's that might be a bit of a throwaway line where it's like, oh, this digital gold, but it basically has all the advantages of gold without any of the disadvantages. And sure, people say, well, I can make jewelry out of gold or I can use gold in electronic components, but that's not why gold really has its value. The reason why gold has its value is because it's scarce. And the reason why Bitcoin has its value is also because it's scarce, but its real power is that it can be transported to anywhere in the world at the speed of light for almost free. We will never be going down to Woolworths to buy a loaf of bread with a little bit of gold where we can shave it off. We will be using, as, as I am, some of the things that I do in my world, I say to uh, the international community when I'm building my site or working on my channel and I need some digital editing, I go to the market or I might have a supplier and I say, how do you want to be paid? Do you want to pay paid in US dollars, Ethereum, Bitcoin? I, I give it to the market. What would you like? And overwhelming, the response from the market, especially in the developing world, is I don't want my local currency because that's dealing with hyperinflation. I don't want the US dollar because that keeps getting diluted and can get, confis can get confiscated by a third party. Give me Bitcoin, give me Ethereum, or give me this other crypto, which is fine. That's uh, democracy and that's freedom, and I give them that. But to answer your question, there was mainly four waves to crypto. So the first wave was the creators back in 2009 with the release of the white, power, white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, an anonymous person or persons who realized the corruption of uh, fiat and governments who ran it essentially after the global financial crisis of 2008. Something had to be better than an endless printing machine, fool's gold, if you will, Tony, where we print this money endlessly that is for fools who believe that money that was worth $100 at one time is now worth only 2% of what it was a few years later. There had to be a better method. So initially in the first wave, it was the creators of crypto and arguably computer nerds who were just getting into the technology of it. The second wave of the value of Bitcoin was in fact during that nasty thing which still holds its uh, brand uh, on or its mark on Bitcoin was the Silk Road. So it was actually drugs and people who were selling narcotics around the world, they needed a form of digital currency that could move value around the world. And that was the second wave of the value of crypto, the Silk Road. The third wave of investors into crypto going on the crypto timeline, noting that it's only really 11, 12 years old nearly, were people like me, people coming in saying, oh my God, I thought I knew money. This is the greatest invention. This is one of the greatest, if not the greatest evolutions of money in the history of humanity and possibly one of the greatest technological advancements that I will ever see in my life. That was the third wave. The fourth wave where you see this recent pump now is institutional investors, not individuals, but companies. I mean, you've got Square, Grayscale, PayPal, Tesla. They're pouring billions upon billions into these markets. Now, the reason why these markets can move so quickly, if you look at a traditional market, first of all, it has a huge amount of money in it. If I, I like to give the analogy of, a, of an ocean and a boat. Uh, so if you imagine I've got a little tiny boat in the ocean, 
and the ocean is at all the money in the world. Well, when I've got that little tiny boat, which we say is a marketplace, and a wave hits that boat, that little tiny boat goes all the way up and all the way down, and it's a huge movement, as we can see in the charts. Now let's compare that same ocean and that same wave hitting a cargo ship, and let's call that cargo ship US dollars or bonds or stocks. The same wave hits the boat in the same way, but because those markets are so big, it's just a little blip on the radar. So the, the cargo ship figuratively just, just moves a little bit. But when we're looking at our tiny little markets of Bitcoin, which are comparatively, I mean, they've crossed into uh, the first time the crypto markets have crossed into a trillion dollars was just recently. But a trillion dollars comparative to all the money in the world is actually absolutely nothing. So initially, when crypto was first growing up from a little rowboat, if you will, and these waves hit it, there was huge moves in it. But we can see over time that as the markets get bigger and the boats per se, going with this example, start to get bigger. Those waves of volatility are not as violent, not as in your face. But that's not to say that there is still not volatility in the markets. And this volatility is the price of performance. Uh, I heard a um, Michael Saylor, uh, uh, the gentleman who invested in crypto uh, years ago, he put in, I believe, a billion dollars into crypto years ago and has made a fortune. He, he said something that's quite profound to me. He said, isn't it amazing how people are so comfortable with a currency that will constantly decline over time, guaranteed? They'll be more comfortable with the money that goes down, that is fiat, than a volatile money that goes up 200% per year. And to me, that was very profound in the sense that it's it showed me that over time that we've become very comfortable with inflation. We've just accepted, for some reason, we've accepted that the $100 that I've got in the bank this year will be worth $95 or $98 next year. And the year after that, it'll be worth even less and less and less. And we've accepted that we're more comfortable with a gradual decline into the ground as opposed to a volatile 200% raise every year. But as the markets begin to stabilize, you can see that this volatility reduces. Now, referring to the chart that you're showing, I'm looking at a slightly different chart, but the same numbers. M many people say to me when crypto pulls back, they're like, oh, so I hear Bitcoin's dropped. And the answer I always give or the response I say, I say comparative to when. So as you can see on the chart that you're looking at there, my very first question, I can't quite see it on my screen here. What, what's the time scale that you're looking at there? Well, I think that's about over the last 18 months or so, uh, Adam. Okay, so uh, the one I'm looking at at the moment is over the last month. So we, we, are still, uh, we are still thousands of dollars higher than what we were 30 days ago. So most certainly we can see a massive pullback in the last 24 hours that has really shocked people who are not used to these markets. To the crypto veterans, this is just another day in crypto land. If you start to expand out and you look at uh, this this performance over the long period, you're looking at around 11 million, uh, sorry, 1.5 million percent over 10 years. And had you got in just a bit earlier, uh, I believe it's about 13 million percent growth. Now, th those numbers are very alarming. If you average it out over a lifetime, it, it's around 200 percent. And the ants, the, uh, the olden day commentators will say, well, well, this is too fast. It's not real. It can't be happening. Well, again, this is the internet of money. Just as the internet of knowledge moves so quickly and so many things progress so fast, much faster than what we're used to in old ways of uh, sharing knowledge, we can expect massive amounts of money to pour into these markets. And I'll also add this um, before handing back over to you, Martin, is that I, I've often said that Let's say Bitcoin uh, just holds its value where it is. Well, it is going to go up in a nominal amount anyway, because we're looking at these prices comparative to the US dollars. Now, we know that the United States has printed, I, I believe it's 20% of all money ever printed in the history of the US dollar has been done just during the COVID period. So all things consistent, Bitcoin has to go up comparative to the US dollar because the US dollar has gone down itself. So you have institutional investors coming in. You have people fleeing out of fiat money. You have people fleeing out of fiat money uh, as investors, but because they have to. Uh, if you're in Venezuela, 
where are you going to put your money? You, you have to get out of there. You have to get out of this fiat currency, not because you want to buy a Lambo, because it is, a, it is literally a matter of life and death. In Venezuela, people were trying to hide from inflation or avoid inflation by, in fact, mothballing white goods. So they couldn't get gold. They couldn't get the US dollar. They couldn't get crypto. So they'd run to the store and buy a washing machine or a dryer or a fridge and wrap it in glad wrap and put it in their basement as a desperate but successful attempt to avoid inflation. So these markets are destined to go up as more people put money in, fear continues to collapse, shifts of money go out of olden day markets into new markets, and the commodity itself or the crypto itself becomes more scarce. Yeah, interesting. And, um, you know, just to build on from that to Cookie Boy through this question, if stock markets crash, will crypto go down with it or will it go ballistic? In other words, is it seen as um, something which is counter to the rest of the market? I suppose in the old days that maybe gold was seen as counter to, you know, flight to quality, you know, it, when, when things get uh, wobbly. Um, I think the other point I'd add into that and before I throw it back to you is we know that there's a lot of spare money flowing around the place you know all the government checks that have been um, thrown around a lot of people investing for the first time I was talking to one of the exchanges recently who said they've never seen so many new accounts being opened as currently and they trace it directly back to more people having more free cash from the government through these handouts both here and overseas and that's created more momentum to be able to actually go and open these accounts and, and, and basically get in on into Bitcoin and hopefully ride it up or ride it down, depending on where it goes. And then the other point there is that um, I use the term momentum, right? Because clearly I have a view personally that I have no idea how to value what Bitcoin is. You know, I have no idea whether it's expensive now or cheap now, right? But the, the long term momentum, as your chart and my chart shows, is it's gone up, right? And most people who are keen on Bitcoin will say, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know, it'll go even higher, right? So what we're doing is here, we're trading momentum. And interestingly, momentum trades are also happening in other categories, like in stocks as well, because there's no actual real connection between the value of stocks at the moment and fundamental value. They've gone way above it. So it's interesting how have enough people who are interested in buying it, right, with money to spend on it, and the momentum created essentially creates a self-fulfilling prophecy for a time. But I suppose the question is, does it have actually come unglued? And we've already seen a couple of times when it's come unglued, but then it's come back again. Or do you think now we've got to the point where there is enough corporate interest and support in Bitcoin that effectively we've got into this next mode of operation? How, how, how do you see that? So what I'm about to say is not financial advice, and we gave that disclaimer in, in the beginning. And, oh, yes. And I would say all investments come with risk. But the, the reality is, wh where do I put my money? So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I've been investing. Actually, I started my investing journey as a boy in stamps. I, where, where can I put my money? So it was stamps, and then it was coins, and then it was property, and it was stocks, and it was super, and it was forex. And then I got more real estate. And, and, and gold, I've got gold and silver. And, and I look across this broad portfolio and it's where do I put my money? And the real pub test now, Martin, is if I were to give you $10,000 and I said, Martin, you can have $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, $10,000 worth of gold or $10,000 worth of Bitcoin. But the caveat is you have to keep it for five to 10 years. We'll, we'll say 10 years to be fair. So you can't take the 10 grand and you know go on a holiday. You, can't take the gold and then just cash it out and you can't take the bitcoin and put it all on a casino you have to hold this for 10 years and people are really speaking with their actions with their money and with the reality that's around them they're saying well i've got to put my money somewhere uh you and i have spoken extensively about property and the the reality that that property isn't this go-to investment that you can go to and and make yourself a millionaire because you're dealing with inflation you're dealing with rates you're dealing with 
insurances, you're dealing with tenants, you're dealing with so many issues that cost you a lot of money and erode your money. Then you go to gold. Well, gold costs about 7% per year to store it. Sure, you can have paper gold, but that's not really your gold. And if anyone, everyone did a run on paper gold, just as if they did a, a run on the banks with fiat, there wouldn't be enough gold or fiat for everyone to be paid. So if you're going to hold gold, you actually have to store it somewhere. And that in itself costs money. And the reality of gold is that gold is not, in fact, an investment that makes you a lot of money. And I say this as almost a life time investor in gold. Gold is a way of protecting your wealth. And that's not to say that that's bad. But if you want to in avoid inflation, you really have to look at gold as purchasing power. So my vision is that in the future, we will not be pricing Bitcoin against fiat. Why? Because fiat's constantly going down. We need to price Bitcoin against something that has maintained its purchasing power for pretty much forever. And that is, in fact, gold. So I think that Gold will certainly exist in the future and has a huge uh, part of economies globally. But again, I can't text you gold. I can't go shopping on Amazon with gold. I can't go to Woolworths with gold. I can't really go anywhere with gold. It's a store of value. I can send Bitcoin at the speed of light around the world. And it is getting faster in the sense that now there are some transaction times and speeds, but just as email had to evolve, so does crypto. So in the future, I envision that Bitcoin will continue to go up in price because the demand will go up, the supply is going down, and we will gauge the price of Bitcoin not against the price of the US dollar or the price of gold, but in fact ounces of gold. Not the price of gold, physical ounces of gold. So I envision that in a few years we'll be saying one Bitcoin can buy, I don't know, 10,000 ounces of gold. And in fact, even if you plot a graph now, a chart of Bitcoin against uh, gold, it's probably a more accurate reflection of how Bitcoin has gone up in value. Because again, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, the US dollar goes down in value because it's diluted, whilst gold holds its purchasing power. There was 21 million Bitcoins ever created. Uh, 18 million of those have been mined. So we've really only got two or three million Bitcoins left to mine out of the code. But of the 18 million Bitcoins that are floating around in the world, if you will, we forecast in the crypto crypto community, we've lost anywhere between four and six million Bitcoin, which means that the supply could be as low as 12 million. We're talking about 12 million Bitcoin, which is probably the rarest stock, bond, commodity, money, gold, whatever you want to call it, anywhere in the world. The other thing I think I often talk about on my channel is hypothetically, so we think gold is great, which is in many ways it is but hypothetically what if we create if we found a huge stash store stock of gold at the bottom of the ocean at the bottom of the grand canyon now it may happen or it may not happen but the reality is we don't know we don't know what the supply of gold is we think we do but there's a lot of the earth that we haven't uh, mined and haven't even accessed yet but with bitcoin we do know we know that there are 21 million bitcoin that's it. And no, a fork of Bitcoin is not Bitcoin. If I fork into Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin Gold or Bitcoin SV, that's not Bitcoin. That's another chain, just as uh, rupees aren't the US dollars, just as euro isn't the Australian dollar. Just because we say it's a money doesn't mean that the people will hold value in it. Yep. And, um, you know, th there is a really interesting, interesting discussion, I think, as you go through the various asset classes, right? So gold or stocks or shares or savings or Bitcoin. My, my own perspective is that um, they all have risks, maybe different risks. There is no sure. such thing as a, a risk-free investment, right? There are always going to be pros and cons, you know, some perhaps more secure, some less secure, some grow more, some grow less. So I always get a bit cross when I see people sort of making a comparison one to another and saying, that's the way to go, right? I can give you three or four reasons why gold is an extremely risky investment, right? Because the price of gold is manipulated. It's manipulated by large players who have very significant vested interests. And there's massive amounts of um, derivatives that drive the price 
of gold, much more so than the underlying, the one-to-the-many relationship means And, that and equally, fear is manipulated through the sale of gold. I mean, if you look yes. at what the British uh, government did stupidly, uh, and, and I say that as a half-British citizen, <laughs> uh, I think you're a half-British citizen as, as well, Martin. Hmm. Uh, uh, they sold so much of their gold to push the British sterling up. That is, they didn't want people to have too much faith in the gold, so they created a fake market in the sense that they said, well, well, we'll dilute the market, we'll increase the supply, we'll increase the supply by pushing heaps of gold out into the market, which made the British pound sterling look like more. Probably one of the greatest financial errors that any government has, been, has ever made. But the reality is, I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you that fiat will go down in value. I can't guarantee you that Bitcoin will go down in value. So when you actually do, if you were going to do a risk analysis, as these big companies are right now, it is now a liability to hold fiat. It is a guaranteed liability, this business model of simply propping up your own stock by taking all of your fiat holdings and putting it back into your stocks and propping it up. That model, that, that manipulation, that, that business model is now dying. We know that if we hold large sums of money, we're going to have to somehow do something with it. Now, do we, do we put it in property? Do we put it in gold? Or do we put it in Bitcoin? And many institutions are now waking up, as are the retail investors, and saying, well, you know what? I've got my property. I've got my cash savings. I've got a bit of gold. Why wouldn't I put something in Bitcoin? And as I've mentioned before many times on my channel, and I think even a conversation with us, it's now at the point that it is financially irresponsible to not, to not put at least half a percent, 0.1 of a percent into Bitcoin. And, you know, the, what, what scares off a lot of the people who are first uh, coming into Bitcoin, they're like, oh my God, Bitcoin is uh, 60, uh, we'll call, talk in US dollars in case we've got an international audience. So looking at the charts, you know, it was coming up past the $50,000 mark, 57. And they're saying, I can't afford $57,000 on a Bitcoin. And I said, well, don't put in 57 cents. And they're like, well, if I put it in 57 cents and it goes up to a dollar, I've only made 43 cents. And I'm like, 43 cents is 43 cents. <laughs> the, the other one is quite funny. Is that I give this analogy is that people say, oh, I'll only make $100 if I put this money in. And I say, if you were walking down the street and you saw a $100 note on the ground, would you say, look, I'm not going to pick up that $100 note because it's not $1,000. <laughs> that last guy got to pick up $1,000, so I'm not picking up that $100. So that's where it's at the point. It's like, hey, if you make 50 bucks off this thing, why not? Hmm. Well, you know, uh, I'll, I'll come clean. I do hold some Bitcoin. I've held it for a long, long time, right? I did it predominantly because I wanted to understand it. And I thought the best way to understand it was to go through the process of getting registered and that's a painful process in Australia to get registered and you know there's hoops you have to jump through mm -hmm. because they have know your customer and things but is that it's actually nothing better than actually having a little so that you can just see how it's operating right so I haven't got a lot but I've got some so now there's a couple of interesting questions which I just want to throw at you now this one came a little while ago um, from prior okay so is internet banking no electricity no ATM no ATM internet banking you know Power. What happens if the power goes down? What happens if we lose the internet? Um, all this digital stuff goes poof, doesn't it? Yep. Fair, uh, great question, and and really fair, and a question that I um, addressed in my mini documentary that I, I really encourage all the viewers to watch the the four greatest threats to Bitcoin. So uh, here I am saying Bitcoin is wonderful, but uh, to balance my argument, I actually spent over a month making a documentary on what are the threats to Bitcoin, mm. and one of those threats is what if what if all the electricity goes down? And the reality is, Martin, is that we are already using digital money. We, the question is, do you want to use digital fiat or digital crypto? So I live in the capital of Australia. The Australian government, the, the, correction, I'll go back a step. The Australian constitution made uh, a right for me to use sovereign tender within what, the borders of my country to take Australian, I don't even have any currency on my to, to illustrate what I'm trying to say here, but if I go to an ACT government shop front, which isn't a federal government shop front, but if I were to go to a federal government shop front also, they will not accept their own money. So I can't take the money that's issued to me by my government to a government shop front. They won't accept it. Yep. They will only accept digital money. So the argument that uh, we have to use cash or 
we can't use digital money. We're already there. We are already in a situation where places will only accept digital money. Now, you and I and Robbie Barwick, uh, Alex Saunders and the good people of Australia fought uh, very hard to ensure that there was no cash ban. <laughs> and we won. We won. And good work to you and the team yeah. and, to, and to all the Australians who rallied out there. Hmm. So the, I answered this question in two parts. Firstly, we don't just have to have one money. Just as we have frequent flyer points, uh, gift cards, bus tickets, uh, credit card points, different currencies around the world, just because we have Bitcoin doesn't mean there only has to be one currency. Concurrently, we are already operating in multiple currencies. All those currencies are listed, but then we have the digital money, which is our credit card or FBOS card. Then we have cash, which the government is actually trying to take away from us, first with the attempt through the cash ban, and secondly with the fact that they don't accept their own money at their own government shop fronts. So if everything were to go down, as we've seen, where digital payment systems have gone down, then we should have cash. Cash is a freedom of speech, a freedom of expression, a freedom of association, where we should be able to spend our money how we want and in privacy. So if we remove cash, as the government was going to do with the cash ban, the argument that uh, we're all doomed if we have Bitcoin because if the digital payment system goes down and there's no electricity, no one can buy anything, they, they counter one another out because we're already on a digital payment system anyway. But to that, I really say, why not have cash as well? Why not have cash and Bitcoin? And the reality is that people actually don't, or governments, uh, I can't speak on behalf of the entire government, it's different governments and we elect them in and it should be a democratic process. But the reason why governments may not necessarily want you to use cash is because A, they can't tax it when we're in a cash economy and B, an argument, which I may not necessarily agree with, is that all the criminals will be using cash and they won't be able to see what's happening. Well, the power of Bitcoin is that, in fact, every transaction is on an open source ledger that everyone can see. The true criminal economy is actually happening in the cash economy, if at all. And the, the ability to have a digital currency, which we are already using, is a, a very important part for all people around the world to ensure that they have a currency that is not constantly going down in value but constantly going up in value. And even if that volatility is going up and down, up and down, it's still over time, 200% on average going up every year, whilst fiat is going down at least two, I, I argue it's about six to 8% every year. And just uh, on this issue of um, where the criminal money goes, right? In plain sight, criminal flows of money go through the university system, they go through the banking system, they go through government departments. Casinos. Right? Yeah. Casinos, yeah. So pretty much wherever you look, you can actually say, you know, it's you can see it if you want to see it, right? So I'm personally very um, concerned about the idea that it's only digital that's got the problem, right? I think actually for the reasons we've said with regard to know your customer and with regard to the uh, tracing of the ledgers and stuff, it's um, you know much less of an issue. And the yep. latest statistics also bears it out, doesn't it? I, I just want to throw one more thing in there because mm, sure. it is a really important question. Yep. What if the financial, what if the digital system goes down? But the, the uh, to extend on that question that the viewer asked, mm. when ledgers, so all money held by banks on a ledger, it's held in their centralized databases. So imagine it's in two parts so you go down to Woolies to buy a loaf of bread and all the FPOS machines are down it's like oh, I can't buy bread tonight but take that one step further imagine the bank is hacked blows up burns down or something and the database that said that you used to hold a thousand dollars is now gone there's no way of you proving beyond a, a credit card statement, which I wouldn't believe anyway, because you could say it was an old one or a new one or whatever. <laughs> the, when you have centralized ledgers or databases, they become very vulnerable to being hacked, compromised, lost, stolen, broken, corrupted, seized. But when you have a decentralized ledger, none of that can ever happen. If, again, in my documentary, we spoke of, I spoke about, let's say there was a nuclear type war that wiped out every single computer, bank, phone network, data system, storage device around the world. First of all, I would have a much bigger problem than which digital currency or any currency we're using. We'd probably be focusing on water and rice as a currency. But secondly, Bitcoin is now, the ledger is uh, 
stored in many places, but including satellites that are floating around the world. So if there was actually a nuclear type holocaust that wiped everything out, or most things out on the earth, we would still have a copy of the ledger floating around in outer space. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And with all of these things, you know, frankly, if the power went down, the Wi-Fi went down, um, it wouldn't just be the digital, it would be pretty much everything, right? So Correct. pretty much every, all communications, um, control of power, water, pretty much and, everything, and, right? And, and many people say, well, th th that's where gold comes in. But th there's two problems with gold uh, and silver. So silver is another one. <laughs> you so can't silver, eat it. <laughs> well, you can't eat it, you can't move it, and it's heavy and you can't verify it. So let's yep. say... Let's say there's a big war or everything collapses and I, I come over to your house and I say, hey, Martin, can I buy that litre of water off you? And you say, yes, Stokesy, it's an ounce of silver. And I pull out an ounce of silver. Well, how are you going to verify that? Hmm. You know, it, maybe it's been diluted. It's been debased, as they used to do. Um, and if I have to ca go from one city to a, another city and I've got to carry a lot of it, this stuff is heavy. <laughs> Spot on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, I've got this theory that um, if things fall apart, the barter systems come back, right? So basically, you 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 know, you barter things for things, right, rather than actually using um, um, something else in between. So we'll see. Absolutely. And there doesn't have to be one money. Again, no. this is where the, there doesn't have to be one money. Mm. Now, there's a very interesting question that Cross Titch and asked a little earlier as well, which I just want to put up. Once you've purchased crypto. Where's the safest place to store it? I have a ledger which looks like a little USB stick. Are there better options? Uh, fantastic question. So essentially when it comes to storage, th there's two types. Uh, hot storage and cold storage. Hot storage is when it's online. It could be on an exchange or a like a cloud wallet. Cold storage is what you're describing there. That, that ledger or hardware wallet is... Uh, arguably the most preferred in the crypto community. So I, I, I actually say on my channel, break it up into at least five. It could be 10, but break it up into at least five different baskets. Some might be on a cloud wallet. So if you have to move quickly or in another country or another city, you can access it. Some might be on a hardware wallet, so it can never be hacked or compromised. And some might be on a paper wallet. And you break it up basically so you don't put all your eggs in one basket. With the issue with hardware wallets is with great power comes great responsibility. So we've become very, uh, I'm trying to look for a, a nice word, but basically dependent on the banks to say, oh, I've lost my credit card or I've lost my pin. Uh, give me a new credit card. Give me a new pin. Give me new access to my, to my money. And as a result, we've become very reliant on the ability to actually lose money. We can lose it through the card. We can do a, a dodgy transaction where we can try and reverse it. But that comes at great sacrifice. It comes at the sacrifice of your money being able to be paused, uh, blocked, stolen. Um, people can put blocks on your account. But when you actually own your own money on a ledger, that great power comes with great responsibility. So when it's on a ledger, it's yours. It's safe. You can. No one can touch it. You can put it in a physical safe. You can put it in a lunchbox and bury it in your backyard like a pirate burying, burying treasure. But here's the go. If you lose that wallet, if you lose that device, if you lose the password, there is no third party that you can go to to try and recover it. So it really comes down to this. My advice, not that I'm getting fine, I'll rephrase that. What I do is I don't keep all my eggs in one basket. I acknowledge that with great power comes great responsibility. And although cold storage is arguably the best way to keep your crypto safe from scammers and hackers and anyone who's trying to compromise with your holdings and even exchange hackers. So if you've got your uh, money on a third party exchange, which many people do hold their cryptos there, if you've got it on your own hardware wallet, no one can get it. But if you lose the password or the device, it's gone. Yeah. And there was that um, famous case. I think it was, was it in... Um, Wales or an island in the UK of, of a guy who actually had a hard drive and a computer and um, had lots of um, coins on it and then sort of lost it and paid or offered a huge reward to the refuse department to try and find his hard drive. That's right. It's actually happened a couple of times and even uh, one of the... Because uh, remember, in the early days of cryptocurrency or in 2000, and it's not that long ago, so a decade ago, 
you could have, and there are stories of people having tens and tens of thousands of Bitcoin on their laptop. And then the girlfriend or one case in particular where I was interviewing Synth from Skycoin, uh, a family member threw out that laptop. And that laptop had what's the equivalent of essentially over $600 million worth of Bitcoin today thrown in the bin. Um, but again, back then, no one was really sure what this thing was going to be worth. And you could mine crypto, as we spoke about mining before. When I mine, I've got very powerful, power-hungry, expensive, ASIC, application-specific, integrated circuit miners that mine this crypto and only fractions of a crypto or a Bitcoin. When Bitcoin was first uh, released, the white paper, you could leave your uh, desktop computer running in the background and mine several Bitcoin overnight yourself. Uh, so you can see over time, people had thousands of Bitcoin that they didn't really take very seriously. Years later, the thing's gone through the roof and that, that, that money is now gone forever. Yeah. Yeah. And I suspect we're going to hear more of those stories as the value goes up. Someone's talking to me about, was it Doggy Coin? Which suddenly, Doge Coin. Yeah. Suddenly sort of took off in value. And he said, I, I mined it years ago. I never really thought about it. I can't remember the password. Yep. Yeah, and it happens. But the good news is when he mined it, whoever that person may be, they wouldn't have spent much money doing it. They probably would have mm. spent a few dollars in electricity. Sure, it's an immense, painful, uh, immensely painful experience as that opportunity has been gone, has been taken away forever, but it wouldn't have cost them that much money. No, indeed. Interesting, isn't it? Now, let's sort of tip the conversation forward and as we sort of come towards the, 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 the end part of the show to say, where is this going to lead to, right? So... The, the thing I'm thinking about is that we've got um, a lot of people around the world talking about negative interest rates. You know, from negative interest rates to work, people have to be weaned off cash and into um, central bank digital currencies because without it, negative interest rates aren't going to work. You've got the um, example of China where you've got um, digital currencies being given out by the authorities in replacement for cash in a number of areas to sort of move there. And of course, in China, you've also got social scores and the ability to be able to control what people do and how, and how they do it. And you've got the central bank digital currencies or the other um, you know, government controlled currencies that are all effectively being tested in various modes. A lot of them are using Ethereum at the moment. So we know that that's going on at the moment. And then you've also got the rise of as we said, DeFi and also the um, the Bitcoin and crypto. How do you think it's going to play out, Adam? I, I think we're going to see the greatest wealth shift in the history of humanity occur in our lifetime, Martin. I think you're going to see, unfortunately, the collapse of many powerhouse um, countries. Uh, because again, remember, there's been a country, countries that have been able to simply press print and create as much money as they wanted. And the world is waking up to what is, in fact, the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of any Ponzi scheme ever, even before Ponzi schemes were invented. This is the biggest one. Why? Because they can just print as much fear as they want. Now, when that power is taken away, the ability to fund the greatest militaries in the world or the biggest militaries in the world with unlimited money, there will be a shift. When there is an economic shift, I believe that we're going to see the collapse of the petrodollar. We're going to see the collapse of the US dollar, just my opinion. And as a result, there will be a void. And when there is a void, something will fill it. Will it be a Western nation or a different nation? That bit I don't know, and it does concern me, because the ability to print all the money in the world forever, when that is taken away from you, no longer can you create value out of thin air, but you actually have to create value out of labor and and supply and goods and something something that is real beyond pressing print on a printing machine or actually on a digital machine so we're going to see a big shift martin we're going to see a big shift in what people understand money to be we're going to see a big shift in the powerhouses of the world and we're all going to also going to be see a big shift in the internet of money this is a new term the internet of money where money can be sent around the world instantly not through a third party such as western union or swift networks where huge amounts of fees are taken simply from trying to present money to uh, give money from one country to another and as a result you're going to see two-thirds of the world's population who have been unbanked forever suddenly become banked 
and not banked through a centralized third party, but banked through a decentralized, open source, immutable and completely transparent system that is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not simply about buying a Lambo. Bitcoin is in fact democracy for the world, pure democracy based on the ability of anyone and everyone having access to the financial global system. We had a shift of people having access to the financial information system and now it's going to move into the financial global, uh, global financial system. And as a result, many third world nations who have been trapped in the third world poverty stricken conditions are now actually going to have opportunities of a lifetime. Sure, in the first world, we're going to have incredible opportunities and be part of the greatest wealth shift in history if we're on the right side of it. But these third world nations, two thirds of the world's population who couldn't get a loan to buy a wheelbarrow are now going to go through decentralized finance and get a wheelbarrow, then a donkey, then a car, then a train, then a complete business. And there will be huge amounts of opportunity for those who really do deserve it. Concurrently though, those who have held power over these financial systems for as long as we can remember, they are gonna scramble very quickly and make big moves to do whatever they can to maintain control of it. And part of that move, Martin, will be printing that dirty fiat and scraping up as much Bitcoin as they can as quickly as they can. The irony of that is that it's just gonna push, push the price higher and higher and higher. And everyone who got in early, whether it was with a dollar or $60,000, is going to be uh, part of this great wealth shift. <laughs> right. Now, let's just bring one more concept in, and that is the Great Reset, right? Because the other thing that, uh, and I've done a few shows on the Great Reset over the last um, few months, because I, I'm very concerned about the way that this phrase is being bandied about without much content, frankly, quite often. But we know that... Um, there are people basically saying, well, in the future you won't earn anything and you'll be happy and everything will be wonderful, you know. <laughs> there are others saying, no, 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 the Great Reset basically is resetting the uh, economy to uh, effectively function differently, you know, maybe more green or, or, or whatever it is, uh, or it's uh, uh, the um, failure of the US dollar and it's the replacement with that with other gold or, or, or something else. Um, so what you've been talking about sounds to me the same sort of language in you know, different words, as it were. I, I, I'm actually glad you raise it. So uh, the Great Reset uh, is actually something that we spoke about, and, and it can come from many uh, angles. The, the reality is this, in, in just in my opinion, the world according to me, the reality is, is that things are always changing. We had the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the American Empire, and anyone who believes that these empires can maintain their strength simply from pressing print on a printing machine uh, truly does not understand money and doesn't understand history. So there will be a shift. The thing with the Great Reset, reset in my mind is that uh, these people who are at the top right now, are they going to take control of this Great Reset and make it happen in the way that they want it to happen so they can maintain their control and their power? Or are the laws of the universe and the reality of things always changing and the shifts of power, is that going to allow things to determine? So I, I don't like to call it the great reset. I, I think it's just going to be a shift. It's going to be the reality that things are always changing. There will be a void. There'll be a big power void and there'll be a big gap. And as a result, that gap will be filled. Those who are at the top, they know it's coming. They're terrified of Bitcoin. They realize its power and they are throwing everything they can at the world to try and make people nervous about the power about of bitcoin that is make sure that they don't think that it's real and can currently uh, do a pronged attack where they can come in and flank what's happening so they can maintain their power at the top <laughs> yeah well you know there's interesting uh, resonances with people that i talk about who don't necessarily hold the same view with regard to crypto but they still have a view of you know, the economy blowing up in some way or the other and, uh, you know, talking about the same issues with regard to the liquidity printing with the, the you know, the erosion of value that's created, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I still I, hold fiat. So um, if yeah. just in case anyone's wondering, I, mm -hmm. I don't liquidate out of everything, you know, as, as you mentioned before, and I agree with you entirely, it, everything has risk. Uh, I think the greatest risk in the world at the moment is fiat. 
I think my real estate portfolio has risk. My gold has risk. Everything has risk. So it really comes down to hedging your bets and and diversifying uh, where you hold everything. And part of everyone's diversification, in my opinion, not financial advice, even if it's half a percent or one percent, should be in Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, well, portfolio diversification. And, you know, we were talking to Damien Klassen um, uh, the other week um, about this whole concept of um, how you build a portfolio. Jason, thank you very much. Uh, cheers. Have a good night. Thanks for coming along. We'll see you next time. And thanks for the contribution. It's greatly received. Uh, Nico, thank you as well. Um, yeah, um, th the point I was, I was going to say was that, you know, this is a complex environment that we're in. There are no simple answers. People will have, I guess, different views about how to deal with it. But what I'm trying to do on this channel is to give people different perspectives and different views. Damien Clasen said, when you build a portfolio, you probably want to have some at the center which is sort of stable and trying to actually, you know, just generate some revenue over time and not be too much risk. But then there should be some other stuff where you take higher risks. You recognize that it might not go the right way, but you can't put everything into one basket because that is a recipe for disaster, particularly now when there are so many variables and so many uncertainties. So building portfolios and building the right mix is actually, I think, probably the biggest challenge that people have. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, with great risk comes great reward and with no risk comes no reward at all. Um, I, I really wish I did have the answers of where to put the money. I, I don't feel confident in the real estate markets. I don't feel overly, I don't feel any confidence in fiat. Um, and I, I certainly don't feel confident in the stock markets, even though um, we can see the stock markets being pumped. But again, is, is that real value or is it nominal value? If we're it's pouring not real money, value. No. It, no, the no. value in the stock markets are, you know, significantly over where it is. And in fact, even the projections on future incomes are based on a sandcastle in my view do you remember um when we a while ago we were preparing for this the stock market to crash and when you and i had an interview and I, I said martin i feel a bit guilty because you know the world is falling down around us because of covid and yet my portfolio my stock um portfolio has gone through the roof and it's like <laughs> this doesn't make sense <laughs> it's going against the laws of nature <laughs> Well, but yeah, but you've got to understand. So if, if, if you look at the, you know, real stocks, right, in the US, there's a lot of buybacks that have been going on because people can get very cheap funds and buy back stocks. And so you'll see that the value of stocks have been increased. We also know that um, everybody, you know, who's now believing that the vaccine rollout is going to somehow magically solve everything and suddenly the economy is going to bounce back and everyone's going to be fine although actually i suspect it may not be quite as uh, straightforward as that um and in fact i've spoken to a number of people in these investment markets who are completely saying look i don't understand it this is momentum trading this is nothing to do with fundamental value and in fact i mentioned momentum trading earlier on in the context of crypto but it is absolutely true in the context of property and stocks as well it's all the same stuff because basically there is all this money flushing around right all this printing all this creation of more stuff right has got to go somewhere and so people are desperate to stuff it anywhere and so they're trading into these momentum plays but there is no fundamental logic right <laughs> and it means it could reverse at some point but i have no idea when it, whether it will be tomorrow next year five years down the track or never. I mean, that's the stupidity that we've got here. And in fact, a lot of um, investment managers that I've interviewed say um, it's unpredictable. We cannot predict what's going to happen. Uh, that's right. And and you think of the main reason why all that's going up is because we're, we're just pouring more money into it, but not money based on value, money based on the printing machine. Uh, it, it's just a nominal amount. It's not a real amount. It's not a real value. It's a nominal value. Yeah. And, you know, I think the argument is that, in fact, um, once we came off the gold standard, you know, way, way back when, we've just been turning that um, handle and just putting more and more liquidity in. And there are people arguing, well, it may not be necessarily inflationary because it depends on where the money goes. But we know that the quantum, you know, the amount is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and to my simple mind, I say, if there's X amount of stuff 
and you've got 2x the amount of money to buy it, <laughs> something's got to give. Yep. Yeah, and that's where we're at the moment. There, there will be a tipping point. And unfortunately, I think it's going to be, come very fast and very hard. Mm. And those who weren't ready are, are going to be in a very difficult position. Now, Cookie Boy just threw this one in. I don't know the answer. How many Bitcoins are there left? Uh, presumably, you mean left to discover. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've mined about... Uh, we touched on this before, but it's a good question. So we've mined about 18 and a half million. Uh, there is actually a site that can show you exactly. So unlike Fiat, I can tell you exactly how much crypto there is floating around in the world at the moment. But of the 18 million we've mined, we've forecasted within the crypto community, four to six million have been lost. And what we mean by lost is the examples of where people have lost their laptops, they've lost their passwords, we've lo they've lost uh, their, their hardware wallets. And the way we can tell that they've lost them is because Either they admit it, they say, I had 10,000 Bitcoin on this laptop, it was thrown out at the tip and I'll never get it back. Or um, we can see that wallets are inactive. That is, we can see that a Bitcoin that has been sitting on the ledger in a certain spot since 2010 has not moved in 10 years. So we can forecast that perhaps because that thing hasn't moved in 10 years, maybe it's been in cold storage for 10 years and they've just got it locked in their safe or it's a possibility that it's been lost. So original forecasts were we've lost about 4 million, which gives us a total supply at the moment of about 14 million floating around the world. But if that is as much as 6 million, there are only 12 million Bitcoin in the world at the moment with about a two, 2 million more to mine. Mm. And the halvings continue, right, every few years. So basically, the, 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 you know, it's not going to be a sort of a linear a process it's going to be logarithmic right that's right of, of those remaining in the code so uh, that's why i'm saying in the early days you could with very little power you would do mining and your reward would be 50 bitcoins then approximately every four years you have a thing called the halving or the halvening uh that instead of mining and getting 50 bitcoins for your reward four years later you only got 25 coins uh then you got 12 and a half and at the um, currently uh, after the most recent halving which didn't happen long ago we're at 6.25 coins and then the next halving will halve that again. So this is why it's so different to fiat. So fiat, the, the worse the problem gets, the, the more money they pump in it, uh, the more money that's created. Bitcoin's a complete opposite. First of all, there is a finite supply, but the release of that supply becomes less and less over time. So when it first started, you didn't need much power to get m many Bitcoins, but those many Bitcoins we're not worth much. Now, as we progress along the crypto timeline, you need a lot more power to get fewer Bitcoins, but those Bitcoins are worth much, much more. Mm. And uh, that takes me very nicely into one last question, which I had beforehand, which was from Anna saying, Bitcoin is environmentally irresponsible because of the amount of power that's required to mine it. And uh, that is increasing. And therefore, if you are you know, green aligned, um, you should not be supporting Bitcoin. Discuss. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad someone raised it because uh, I, I can very easily counter the argument. So there is no doubt whatsoever that Bitcoin mining uses a lot of energy. But I challenge you to think about this in the banking system. And then I'll, I'll tell you how we can become, we are more efficient in Bitcoin mining. How much energy do you think it takes to build a multi-story bank, furnish that bank, clean that bank, heat that bank, cool that bank, have thousands of people drive to and from that bank every day, run the servers in that bank, cool those servers in the bank, build the servers, upgrade the servers, the amount of energy, resources and environmental waste that is poured into banking systems is far beyond what we're using in the Bitcoin space. So this is a another example of a scare tactic from banks saying, hey, we better not use that dirty money because it's bad for the environment. Meanwhile, they're not saying how much energy banks use. Banks use unforeseeable amounts of energy, even if you just look at their service alone. But once you actually look at, if you calculate people driving to and from a bank, sitting in the bank, turning on the computer, heaters, water, air conditioning, everything, unforeseeable amounts of energy. But I take it a step further. The power of Bitcoin is that if I want to run a mining farm, I can actually move miners to where there's free electricity. For example, in China, 
they have massive amounts of hydroelectricity where they have excess amounts of it. So they simply build these mining farms next to hydroelectric plants where there is excess electricity, free electricity. I can't do that with a bank. I can't pick up a bank and say, righto, all you staff, you're going to go work next to that dam. Another way that we get free electricity is through uh, thermo uh, electricity, um, where steam comes out of the ground. I can't remember the exact term at the moment. So you have a lot of steam coming out of the ground. You build generators or turbines over the steam. It turns those turbines and you're essentially capturing free electricity and you put the miners next to those. So there was a concept which uh, initially failed, but I, I foresee will come back again, where you just build shipping containers full of mining rigs, full of miners. And wherever the free electricity is, you take those shipping containers to that free electricity and you run the blockchain essentially for free. Concurrently, because there is so much money involved in running these things, innovation is progressing very quickly. How do we get these more efficient? So yes, Bitcoin does use a lot of power to run the blockchain. No, it is not more than the banking system. And no, it is not, uh, uh, banking systems are nowhere near as mobile as the mining systems that we have for crypto. But it's a great question, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, like all of these things, you know, sometimes the arguments uh, are surprising because people come at it from different directions. So uh, thank you very much to um, uh, Jeff for his uh, contribution there. Um, now, OK, we're coming up close to the end of the show. Um, a couple of people asked, where can they find out more information? Are there some books or sites where, what would you recommend? Other, of course, than your site, which, um, <laughs> you know, just to, uh, to re-emphasize, um, Adam Stokes' uh, site on YouTube is a brilliant site. Some massively, massively important interviews that he's done there. But uh, where else would they go, Adam? Look, you're right. In the first instance, go to Adam Stokes on YouTube. And if you're very new to it, go to a, another sort of mini documentary I made. It's called The Seven Ways to Make Big Money in Crypto. So those seven ways will tell you how to make money in crypto. It's not just a case of buying low and selling high. Then when you want to enter it, go to thecrypto.land. That's www.thecrypto.land. And that is a website that I own that I... I only put sites that I have tested on there. So most people lose in crypto, not from the act of buying crypto or losing the password. They lose in crypto because they get scammed from going to a, a non-legitimate site. And here's the conundrum with that, Martin. At the moment, Google will not allow legitimate companies to advertise crypto through Google ads or other Google um, sites where you can Otherwise, advertise. If I was advertising this pen, I could do a Google ad for it. But if I'm advertising a crypto exchange, there's a lot of limitations on uh, those exchanges by Google. So what happens is it creates a void, and that void is filled by scammers. Scammers come in for 10 or 20 days. They run a set of Google ads before the Google alg algorithm picks up that, hey, that's a scam, we'll shut it down. People put their money into something that they think is Bitcoin. They lose all the money, and they say, Bitcoin's a scam. Bitcoin's not a scam. You were scammed by a scammer. So to protect yourself, make sure you only go to legitimate sites such as the crypto.land. Also go to my site to learn more about it. And always remember when crypto is pulling back, if something takes 10 steps forward very quickly and then takes two steps back, don't be scared. <laughs> Good advice. Well, Adam, um, I think we've pretty much come to the end of the show. There's a few more people wanting questions, but uh, we could go on all night doing that. Um, anything finally you wanted to underscore before we finish? No, I just want to acknowledge, Martin, uh, your long work in doing the right thing by the people, trying to help the Australian people uh, build and protect their wealth from this crazy world that we're living at the moment. There are a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, you and I met from... Uh, the, the cash band, the fight on the cash band bill. Uh, we had different paths to where we're going, but the destination was the same. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work with you. And to all the viewers out there, if you want to learn more about crypto, again, come over to Adam Stokes <laughs> or visit me at the crypto.land. Uh, Adam, well, I appreciate uh, your time tonight. Thank you very much. I always enjoy chatting with you. Um, you know, we may not agree on everything, but I think there's some really fascinating discussion to have. But more importantly, this is about helping more people understand more and 
build more expertise and I think that's what we both uh, aspire to do so thank you very much for that I'm going to um, take you offline now and I'll just close up the rest of the show so thank you and we'll uh, talk again soon Adam thank you Martin okay so there we are folks um, interesting conversation a lot of uh, really uh, uh, powerful stuff going on in the chat I didn't uh, have a chance to put them all up and yes uh, I may have been a bit selective on some of the comments but that was because there were so many of them so I can't necessarily put them all up but they're all there you can see afterwards now in terms of next week just to say that uh, I'll be running my live show and that will be the latest household stress and probably market update I'll have the uh, postcode um, data online as, again as well so uh, mark your diary for that the 2nd of March the following week um, I will have one of our famous um, property analysts on Louis Christopher's coming on on the 9th of March and the week after that I've got Tony LeCantro booked so it's going to be an interesting few weeks and just finally to let you know that uh, tomorrow um, I'm participating in a discussion uh, actually run by the Australian um, and uh, there will be a couple of people um, discussing probably investing and uh, and how that uh, may or may not play out and because they were originally going to stream it over Facebook and then couldn't um, I've agreed that I'm going to stream it live here on the channel so um, if you want to hear me uh, talking to uh, a couple of people with different perspectives on property investing and what may or may not be the right thing to do have a look the uh, the shows they are up as a, a live stream uh, tomorrow and it's going to start at 6 30 so that's just a reminder on that. So thank you very much for spending some time with me and with Adam this evening and uh, wish you a very good evening and I'll look forward to seeing you again next week when we'll be talking mortgage stress, property and all the latest data. Take care, have a good evening and thanks very much for spending some time with us this evening. Cheerio.